Well, hello again, everyone. This is Mitchell Moat, an extension agent here with the University of Tennessee and Tennessee State University Extension Program in Rutherford County. And uh, it's my opportunity today to, to, to bring you this episode of the Rutherford County Farmers Market Education Series. And the, the topic today is the top 10, or I say top 10, top 10 give or take tree and shrub problems. Now, as uh, as a landscape manager, if you if you are a homeowner and you manage your own landscape, then you are a landscape manager. If you take care of the landscape, and, and as that landscape manager, as the as the owner of the property, you know we invest money in trees and shrubs for landscaping purposes, just for aesthetics, just for uh, recreational use, to add beauty, add comfort, and so on to the property. And, and we don't want them to die. We don't want them to die, but ultimately, uh, you know, we don't, they're going to die. They will. Our, our job as, as managers of this uh, uh, landscape is to prolong that life as long as we can to keep the trees and the shrubs as healthy and as vigorous as possible for as long as possible. But uh, the, uh, the reason I say that is that very often folks will uh, ask a question of us here at the extension office about a particular tree. You know, I'd, I'd hate for that tree to die. Well, the thing we've got to keep in mind is that they will all die sooner or later, but they do have a finite life, but they are long lived and we can do uh, what we can, what's reasonable to keep them strong and vigorous and growing for as long as possible within the potential for their lifespan. So anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about some of the top reasons that plants and shrubs die. So wh why do trees and shrubs die? And I said plants and shrubs, I mean trees and shrubs. Why do they die? Well, a number of reasons. Trees and shrubs die because respiration stops, because carbohydrate production stops and stored energy reserves were depleted. Uh, carbohydrate production stops because photosynthesis stops. And photosynthesis stops because the necessary factors uh, are interrupted. Those are things like the sunlight, water, nutrients, etc., cetera, uh, that are responsible for, pho for photosynthesis. Uh, and, and factors for photosynthesis are often interrupted because of actions of nature, but sometimes human activities can have an influence on uh, interrupting uh, the, the availability of factors that are necessary for photosynthesis as well. Now, uh, th those things that do uh, influence photosynthesis, things like sunlight, you know, or the, or the plant's ability to capture sunlight, okay, uh, water, whether it's an excess amount of water or a shortage of water, nutrients available to plants, trees and shrubs, and again, that could be an excess of nutrients or a shortage of nutrients, uh, air temperatures, soil temperatures, the amount of carbon dioxide available to plants, and also the amount of oxygen available to plants. Uh, we're going to focus primarily today on the, uh, the sunlight and the water factors uh, that are necessary uh, for photosynthesis and for plants to survive. Um, you know, anything that we do to influence the amount of sunlight that a plant receives is going to influence how well that plant survives. If we, as a landscaper, as a landscape manager, as a homeowner, if we put a plant uh, that requires uh, full sunlight in a shady place, we are limiting the amount of sunlight that plant can get. And that's human, that's, that's human action, that's human factor. We're influencing that. Uh, likewise, if, uh, if we do something that alters the amount of uh, sun that a particular area receives, for example, in this slide, a nice fence is put up. You know, fences can be attractive. They can uh, improve, uh, improve the livability of a piece of property by giving you some privacy between you and your closest neighbor. But it can also influence the amount of sunlight and air movement and so on that goes through uh, that particular landscape and that can alter the amount of sunlight available for plants to intercept and that can influence, that can alter uh, their, uh, their productivity, their photosynthetic productivity. So we've got to keep that in mind. Now other things can also influence the amount uh, of sunlight that uh, plants can intercept. So, and, and we may not always think about those things, so let's look at those. We're going to look first of all, here's an example of a, of a burning bush, a nice shrub here. And if we look a little closer, we'll see that the, the, the leaves don't have uh, the, the dark uniform green color that we'd like for them to have, uh, what we would consider to be a healthy euonymus shrub. Uh, you'll notice uh, in the slide here, some, some yellow areas, uh, so just scattered yellow areas. We refer to that as stippling. What causes that? And you also see the, a very similar appearance here uh, on this maple leaf. Again, you can see the green, but also some yellowing there, some yellow uh, little pin pricks, if you will. Uh, and, and again, that's called stippling. Well, what causes that? Uh, these things called spider mites are uh, notorious for causing uh, chlorophyll damage in these plants. 
And, and that's what we're seeing. That's what the stippling is. It's the result of spider mite feeding activity. These guys have uh, piercing mouths. They, they like little needles. And every time they pierce that leaf tissue to feed or to suck fluid from the plant, they, they kill chlorophyll in the process. So the more chlorophyll that's, that's killed, then the less active chlorophyll there is there to allow that plant to, to catch sunlight. And also they're sucking water out of the plant. Uh, as well. So here's an example of a two-spotted spider mite we see. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is on a laurel, and uh, you notice the, the stippling again. Okay, on the leaf surfaces, you got some green, but you also notice all that little yellow stippling in there. If you look a little closer, it's got some red spider mites on it, uh, and they can be active in the warm weathers. You know, the, the two-spotted mites, they're, they're warm weather mites are more active in warm weather. This is a southern red mite that was, this picture was taken in February. They're active, but these little spider mites can cause damage to the chlorophyll in those plants and the more in those leaves and the more damage they cause to the chlorophyll the less chlorophyll there is there to help that plant catch the sunlight which is necessary for photosynthesis. Uh, here is another uh, example and we flip it over and there's a spider mite feeding on the back of that thing. Uh, a, a rose okay and you see the little mites uh, present there. Spider mites can attack a lot of different uh, woody ornamentals, trees and shrubs both, but they are sucking insects, they, they, they destroy chlorophyll when they pierce that leaf tissue to feed, and that reduces the amount of chlorophyll that's available to help that plant catch sunlight and then to make photosynthesis. Here we've got an arborvitae. You look uh, in the upper portion of this slide, uh, you see a healthy arborvitae uh, leaf tissue. Down below that, you see arborvitae leaf tissue that is not so healthy looking. And the reason for that not so healthy looking leaf tissue, you guess it, it's those little spider mites right there. This is a spruce spider mite. That's one of those cool weather mites. Lots of these mites are available. They, they Like I said earlier, they feed on these plants. Uh, they can be active in both warm weather and cool weather. They're just destroying chlorophyll, which takes away the plant's ability to catch some sunlight. So that reduces one of those factors necessary for photosynthesis. Uh, here you see a euonymus shrub, and it's uh, probably a variegated euonymus to start with. With, but it doesn't look so good. You've got a lot of leaf loss there, uh, uh, defoliation, you can see bare limbs. We look closer and what do we see? We see examples of these little scale insects, these euonymus scale that will attach to the underside of leaves and also on the stems themselves, sort of like uh, the spider mites we looked at previously. As they feed, they destroy, uh, they destroy uh, leaf tissue, which destroys uh, chlorophyll, which takes away uh, the, the plant's ability to catch sunlight because it doesn't have as much chlorophyll there as it did. It reduces its uh, uh, photosynthetic ability, uh, the, the photosynthetically active uh, leaf tissue, and also it sucks life, it sucks fluid zone out of, uh, out of the stems of the plants and out of the leaf foliage themselves and, and can cause some dieback in there. Uh, those are kind of hard scales. On this example here, you see some soft scale insects, uh, the large white uh, uh, soft looking scale insects that are attached uh, both to the foliage and also to the stems. And you'll also notice this black material on here. What is that from? That, this is a close up shot of that uh, dark colored material. And that is uh, something called sooty mold. The soft scale that we see here, they secrete their, their excrement is called uh, a honeydew or frass. Their, their frass is called honeydew. And that honeydew drips down on leaves underneath them. And that uh, honeydew the, is, is a, a, the substance, that excrement is a good environment for sooty mold to grow in. Well, you get this black sooty mold growing on the, the, the exterior of a leaf surface and it blocks, uh, it blocks sunlight because you don't have as much green leaf tissue available, uh, that chlorophyll, active chlorophyll available, uh, exposed to sunlight to catch uh, sunlight and help make uh, photosynthetic energy. So it can have an impact on that. Uh, here we're looking at a hackberry leaf. Uh, these are Asian woolly hackberry aphids. These little white fluffy things you see pictured here. They, they are an aphid. Aphids like, uh, like mites and like scale insects are sucking insects. A lot of different kinds of aphids out there. Uh, but they, they produce a lot of honeydew. Okay, so, so these little insects, they feed on the leaves, and these are particular to, to uh, hackberry trees, but there's, again, lots of different uh, aphids that feed on a variety uh, of tree and shrub plants, but they pierce that leaf tissue, they suck fluid out, they damage chlorophyll, as, and also they excrete the, the honeydew, which gives a good environment for the sooty mold growing. Uh, on this leaf example here, this is on an azalea, and we see a lace bug uh, feeding on the bottom of that azalea leaf. That lace bug, uh, again, 
damages chlorophyll when it feeds, and it reduces the amount of chlorophyll available in that leaf to help catch sunlight. And without the sunlight, the plant is not as photosynthetically active as it once was. So those are all pests that can uh, influence the amount of uh, chlorophyll available in leaf tissue, which is uh, influences uh, how photosynthetically active that plant can be. But in this example, we see a rose, and on that rose, we, we don't see uh, the same kind of feeding damage. We see actual leaf tissue being consumed. This is a rose slug. It's a, a sawfly larva, and it's actually eating leaf tissue away. But as it eats away that leaf tissue, it takes away chlorophyll, doing the same kind of thing. Here's a leaf example with the Japanese beetle feeding damage. They're, 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 they're physically destroying the leaf tissue itself, not just the chlorophyll, but the entire leaf tissue. And you know, you look at this leaf, there's not near as much green uh, uh, healthy leaf tissue there on, uh, compared to a leaf that has not been attacked uh, by some of these chewing insects, then that leaf's not going to be as photosynthetically active. So the more feeding damage that uh, a plant uh, accumulates uh, and, and the more uh, the, the more of the, the, the entirety of the canopy that's involved in that, then that reduces its photosynthetic activity because it cannot catch as much sunlight. Uh, here's another example on this elm tree and the elm beetle feeding, causing that kind of damage. But those insects that, 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 that kill the chlorophyll by sucking on the plant, or they, they destroy chlorophyll by physically consuming uh, the leaf tissue itself, can all reduce uh, the amount of chlorophyll in the photosynthetic activity. Uh, what do you do about those things? You know, the, the, the mites, the scale insects, and other leaf attacking pests, there are a variety of different uh, insecticides, miticides that are very effective against uh, those pests. Uh, even something as uh, benign as horticultural oil uh, can control all stages of scale and mite pests. Although using something like the oil, it is uh, a very uh, important to have thorough coverage because it's a contact only uh, uh, control agent. And if you if you don't treat a particular area, if you got a big shrub, a big tree, and you fail to uh, get the spray, uh, the oil sprayed onto one of those sections you didn't treat that section but again and it can be difficult to control some of these larger plants but there are control measures out there horticultural oil as i said and the number of different insecticides and miticides do have efficacy against a broad spectrum of these different uh, insect and mite pests but another thing that can cause uh, a reduction of photosynthetically active leaf tissue, okay, or, or the amount the leaf tissue that, that has uh, active chlorophyll in it are some of the diseases, leaf spot diseases. Here you see an example uh, of an apple leaf. It's suffering from cedar apple rust. All of those rust lesions, you know, they're there's not active chlorophyll inside those lesions and you're taking away the amount of green leaf tissue so therefore you're reducing uh, the uh, amount of chlorophyll available in that leaf to catch sunlight and to photosynthesize energy. This is just an example of the, the cedar part of the disease. This is the cedar gall, if you will, that uh, releases spores in the spring of the year which are then carried by air uh, and they fall on susceptible plants like this uh, uh, apple leaf that we saw in the previous, uh, in the previous picture and infects them. Uh, another example is uh, this euonymus with powdery mildew on it. Uh, this uh, uh, maple with uh, anthracnose. Those, uh, the, the powdery mildew in this previous slide, you know, the, those gray areas, those tan areas, those brown areas, that those areas of the leaf aren't photosynthetically active. So we're reducing the amount of sunlight that this plant can capture and therefore influencing its uh, ability to photosynthesize its energy. Same thing is true with this maple with the anthracnose leaf spots there. Again, that's a, that's a fungal disease and every one of those brown spots, you know, that's, there's no chlorophyll there. So we're reducing the amount of leaf, green leaf tissue available uh, in that plant to catch that sunlight and photosynthesize that energy. Uh, another example, this is a dogwood with some spot anthracnose on it. Now, you know, very often it's not uncommon in, in the wet springs of the year for some of these diseases to be more pre prevalent than others. And if it's a good strong plant to start with, a few episodes, uh, a few seasons going through uh, the plant becoming infected with some of these leaf diseases uh, and reduces the amount of energy or maybe cause a little premature defoliation, that may not be the end of the plant. Okay, if it's a good strong plant, it's not. But it weakens the plant. Okay, because it is taking away uh, that, that green tissue, the, the, the amount, the total quantity of green tissue. And, and when, things, when stresses start building up over time, if this happens time and time and time again, it can weaken the plant and, and shorten its life cycle in the, or its lifespan uh, in the whole process. So what can you do for some of these foliar diseases? Well, the bulk of those are caused by fungi and uh, they can be uh, treated uh, preventatively 
preventatively with the broad spectrum fungicide, but it is difficult to spray a fungicide onto a large tree. Uh, as I said before, it may not be necessary uh, to do that on uh, every time because if it's a good, healthy, strong tree in the first place, a good, strong, healthy shrub, you know, a few instances of uh, uh, be, being attacked by anthracnose, for example, are not going to cause uh, long-lasting damage. But if this occurs time and time and time again, then uh, it can, uh, the damage can accumulate and the tree can be weakened or the shrub can be weakened with, uh, weakened with time. But again, it is difficult to spray large trees to apply that fungicide protectively. So uh, you might think about doing other things just to help keep that tree in uh, uh, reducing the stress on the tree uh, to ensure that it doesn't uh, hurt for a, a, a lack of water in the, in the hot weather months and dry periods, et cetera. You know, there are a few of those foliar diseases that are caused by bacteria uh, and, and they require treatment with, uh, with an antibiotic. But again, it's difficult uh, for, for a homeowner at least to apply uh, some of these spray materials to large plants. Um, now, we talked about sunlight, okay, we said we're going to focus on the, the factors of sunlight and water that influence uh, photosynthetic activity. So now let's talk about water. So water has to be absorbed by the roots of the plant and it has to be moved up into the plant and uh, and, and it also uh, the fluids in the plant have to move both up and down. So that plant has vascular tissue or circulatory tissue in there. Okay, so anything that 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 compromises that vascular tissue is going to interfere with, with the, the uptake of water or, or movement of fluids within that plant. So anything that fits in that category that, that, that compromises that vascular tissue or, or limits the ability of the plant roots to take water up falls into uh, the, the category of, of, of uh, uh, compromising the amount of water that a plant can take up. So we look at this, uh, this example of this little juniper plant right here and you see the symptoms. It's got loss of color, uh, it's wilting, uh, you see dead tissue in the plant. Well, what causes that? Well, it's not above ground. The problem is below ground. We pull that plant up and look at that root ball. Look how dark, look how black it is. Uh, that's indicative of uh, uh, rotten roots, if you will, root rot. It's sick. Why is it sick? Because that hole that it was planted in, or that area that it was planted in, holds water. And excessive water in the root zone uh, creates an environment for some of these soil-borne pathogens to, to populate. Uh, and when the population gets great enough, they will attack the, the roots, move into it, populate those roots, and damage the roots. Uh, you see an example here uh, of this uh, holly it's, uh, and it's suffering from black root rot. You'll see areas of green foliage but also lots of brown or dead looking foliage in there. And if you look closer at the roots here, uh, as we pull this plant out of the pot, you look at the outside of the root ball and you can see lots of dark color, uh, colored roots in there. You look a little bit closer, lots of dark black colored roots. Okay, Those roots do not actively take up water they're dead, they're not going to work anymore. Again, a closer magnification. Uh, and, and excessive water standing uh, within the root zone is a leading contributor to the development of these root rot diseases. Uh, here you see an example of a, uh, a boxwood hedge. Uh, the boxwood, let's back up, the boxwood is showing lots of green color and that looks pretty good, but you've got these straw colored dead areas in there. What's causing that? We take a cutting off of it and you can see coming, uh, it looks like almost off the same stem. You've got green foliage on one side, you've got uh, dead straw colored brown foliage on the other side. We go into a little bit closer down near the base of the plant, you scrape away the bark and you can see these dark colored areas right underneath the bark. That's where that vascular tissue is, that circulatory tissue. And that dark color is not healthy tissue. Okay, it's been compromised. It has a disease that has altered, it has influenced, it has compromised that circulatory tissue, and so it's not taking that water up anymore. This is an example of Phytophthora crown rot or Phytophthora root rot uh, that is uh, uh, infected this plant and influences its ability to take water up. It plugs up that or damages that vascular tissue, and so uh, since it's not taking the water up, then above the plant, the foliage uh, above the ground, it looks like it's dying from lack of water because it is, but it wasn't a shortage of water necessarily that caused it, not a shortage of water in the environment, a shortage of water in the plant. It was because the, the water was held too long, too tightly uh, for a long period of time in that root zone and allowed those uh, pathogens, those soil pathogens to populate and to infect, uh, infect the plant and then compromise that vascular tissue uh, that we see uh, illustrated here in this particular slide. Uh, we look here at this big tree. 
Well, my gosh, what is wrong with that thing? Big old strong healthy tree and there's lots of trees around it in this photograph that look good. But what's the big difference? This tree is surrounded by what? Its root zone is covered by pavement. It's been paved over. So it no longer, that root zone is now covered up by a, a predominantly impermeable layer so that water does not have an opportunity to infiltrate and to move down into that root zone. That also changes, uh, it also changes uh, the oxygen content in the soil as well. But the big issue right here is we've taken away the ability for that plant uh, to have access uh, to, to soil water. Uh, and, 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 and a lack of water, just as much as an excess of water, can cause the same kinds of damage, can cause uh, plant death. Uh, other examples that can interfere uh, with potential root uptake uh, of, of water out of the soil or uh, uh, damage of vascular tissue. Here you see an example of a tree that was, it was a bald and burlap tree. So it was a soil grown tree. It was dug out of the nursery. It was planted, but that burlap uh, was not removed from around the upper portion of the ball and it wasn't planted deeply enough to cover it up in its entirety. And what you've done here is you have, uh, and this is a natural burlap fiber and it's it, because it is a natural fiber it has the ability to wick water moisture in the soil it's like a candle wick or a lamp wick an old a coal oil lamp wick you know the, the, the bottom of the wick goes into the water that and it pulls the coal oil up into the lamp where you can light it and give off some light uh, the, the same kind of the principle is happening right here you've got this exposed uh, uh, conductive uh, uh, material, this burlap, it's exposed to the atmosphere. Any water down in the soil below there can be, uh, can follow uh, this fabric up into the atmosphere and be evaporated. So we're taking away uh, some of the water out of that root zone there where that plant is. Here you see an example of another container or a ball and burlap plant, a field grown plant, and a strap was not removed uh, from that uh, around the trunk of that tree when it was planted. That's a heavy duty nylon strap there. They don't deteriorate very fast. And the plant, the, the tree has grown over it, it's grown around it. Well, what damage is, what, what, what's the problem with that? You know, it damages, it compromises, it cuts into that circulatory, that vascular tissue because that tissue is found just underneath the bark of the tree. Uh, and it doesn't have to cut in there very deeply before it starts compromising that. You know, it's the, the same principle if you tie a string around your finger, you leave it on there, if you tie it tight enough, and leave it long enough, then your finger will die because uh, you have cut off blood flow to it. Well, in essence, we have uh, damaged the circulation of this tree by leaving that strap, which has uh, uh, basically has girdled the tree itself and it's damaged that vascular tissue. And you can see the result of it. This is the picture of the above, uh, the, the aerial portion of the tree that we just saw the picture of with the, with the strap around, uh, growing into the trunk of the tree down there below ground or ground level. Uh, here you see this English oak, this columnar oak. It's got die back in the upper uh, in the upper canopy of the tree up here. But look at all the mulch around this thing down here. You know, mounted up mulch like that when it when it gets really dry, uh, it, and the way it's mounted, it's going to repel water away from that tree and not let water soak into that tree. So in in a case like this, excessive mulch uh, can be more damaging uh, th than no mulch at all. Uh, it's better to have no mulch than to have mulch applied excessively and incorrectly because this just uh, uh, minimizes the amount of water available through natural rainfall or irrigation that's uh, available for this, uh, the, the, the root zone of this tree uh, to have access to, to pick it up. Uh, what can we do to minimize water-related root problems? Well, first of all, plant the tree correctly. Don't plant the bush too deeply. Don't plant the tree too deeply. Uh, if, if you're planting into an area that may have poor drainage, that wants to hold water for a long period of time, you know, do things to improve that, improve the drainage before you put the plant in the ground because you're not going to, realistically, you're not going to change it after you put the plant in the ground. So if that means amending uh, the entire planting area heavily, you do that. If that means that you add, the, uh, you dig a sump hole into the bottom of the planting hole as you plant those uh, to help drain water away, you do that. And then if you're using irrigation, use it correctly. You know, soil can only take in and, 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 and percolate so much water through it, and, and you can't just uh, automatically say this thing, this irrigation system needs to run for 20 minutes three times a week. Uh, you've got to figure that out a little bit. How fast does the water drain through the soil? So the irrigation has to be used correctly or it's of no value to you. Then finally, another thing that will influence or damage the vascular tissue We'll look at some examples of, uh, like you see in this picture, uh, this is a tree and what appears to be sawdust down the around the base of the tree. Well, the reason it looks like sawdust is because it is sawdust. Here's another example of a tree with all this fine sawdusty powder around the base of it. 
Well, that's not a good sign at all. Here on this little tree, you can see uh, the, these sawdust tubes or uh, frass tubes, if you will, look sort of like toothpicks sticking out uh, from the tree. Okay, well, what's causing this kind of damage? Well, this, this is insect damage. You know, insects, boring insects that go into that tree, uh, they, they, they feed, they move in the, uh, uh, just under the bark in that vascular tissue, in that cambium layer of the tree, uh, and, and consume uh, tissue uh, in that cambium layer that damages that vascular tissue. Okay, and the more the vascular tissue is damaged, this is a particular case is an ambrosia beetle or a shot hole kind of bore, uh, but the more that vascular tissue is damaged, then that influences the, uh, the potential for water to be taken up uh, by the root zone and moved up into the upper canopy of the tree or the shrub, and also for, uh, for energy that's uh, created uh, by, the, uh, by, the photos, by the photosynthesis in the canopy of the leaves carried back into the roots to be stored down there. So that it compromises, uh, that compromises uh, uh, the, the vigor of the tree because it's dying of poor circulation. Another kind of insect you see damage here uh, of a metallic flat-headed bore. Uh, metallic flat-headed bore. You see this, uh, th this, this damage on this uh, maple tree. Uh, the large callus area tried to form over the outside. You can see the exit holes are kind of D-shaped. That lets you know it's a flat-headed bore uh, because it is flat on, flat on one side and the, the rest of the thing is rounded, kind of a D-shaped exit hole. But all this vascular tissue that was uh, active here uh, before that bark was all sloughed away, you know, it it's been damaged uh, by the by the activity of those insects uh, by moving underneath uh, underneath that bark in that uh, in that vascular tissue. So you have poor circulation. Uh, you look at this little maple tree. Uh, you notice it's a fairly young maple tree, but you've got uh, some thinning in the canopy in this tree up here. What's causing that in a young tree like this? You look closer at the bark of the tree, and we see this Japanese uh, scale, Japanese maple scale. A heavy population of like little barnacles attached to the bark of that tree, and they're sucking fluid out of the tree. They're influencing them out of water flow, uh, moving up into the tree, throughout the tree, and so on. So that again influences the amount of water that is available for the tree that is necessary for it to, it to survive. Uh, here's some more scale insect uh, down here on this laurel shrub. You see a heavy population all up and down the stem of it right there. Uh, here's a close-up uh, of some of the scale insects. Uh, this is, these are adult scale, and uh, that's, that's a covering. That's why they're called scale. They have that hard uh, or relatively hard covering uh, over, over the exterior of the adult scale. That's why they're called scale insects. Uh, here we see uh, a hard scale on the uh, on tulip popper branch. Again, a lot of different kinds of scales, soft scale, hard scale, etc. cetera. Uh, these, uh, had, what can you do to control some of these scale insects and these boring insects? There are systemic insecticides that a homeowner can apply uh, that can prevent uh, heavy damage uh, from some of these insects. Uh, they can be applied preventatively so that tree roots and shrub roots pick them up that, and, and translocate them up throughout the canopy of the tree so that when uh, one of these susceptible insects feeds on that tree, they ingest some of the insecticide and it, uh, it kills them, controls them. Uh, horticultural oil also has efficacy against scale insects, but again, it's difficult to spray a large tree and, and horticultural oil uh, has to come into contact with the pest or it's not going to be of any control value. And it is possible to use some trunk sprays, uh, some uh, insecticide trunk sprays where the trunk area uh, is treated to maybe catch some of those uh, uh, boring insect pests when they emerge uh, from the tree uh, to help break it up. So there's some different insecticide products out there that can help uh, main, minimize some of the damage, uh, potential damage from uh, these scaled and boring insects. Uh, and let's look here at this elm tree now. This is another potential problem. You see the browning foliage up here in the elm tree. You got dieback, canopy thinning out. You look closer, you see brown edges on some of the leaves there. What causes that? Well, this is a vascular disease. It's a wilt disease. And this is uh, the little elm uh, branch that's been cut off and the bark has been peeled back. Notice how the dark streaks in this vascular tissue right underneath them. This is, this is where the vascular tissue is, right here underneath this bark layer. That dark tissue is not conductive very well anymore. It does not, it does not allow circulation anymore. It's been plugged up, if you will. And, and that's what this is, Dutch elm disease, and that's a vascular disease. It plugs up that, uh, that circulatory, that vascular tissue. It does not allow that water to move from the roots up into the canopy of the tree. And you start seeing the brown scorching uh, that you saw here on, this previous, uh, on the previous picture of the, you know, the darkened edges. Well, what causes that? Lack of water in the foliage. And the reason it's lack of water in the foliage is because 
because the, the vascular tissue has been compromised and it will not allow that water to move up in that foliage. So you get that scorched look, uh, a lack of water look, a Dutch elm disease. Uh, here's a, 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 a red oak tree uh, and you see the canopy thinning out on that red oak tree. This can happen over a period of time and we see leaves from a red oak like that. This I believe from a pin oak. Um, it has that same kind of scorched leaf appearance. Well, this is another one of those vascular diseases. It's called bacterial leaf scorch. This is a bacterial disease, but it does kind of the same thing that uh, the uh, uh, Dutch elm disease does. That bacteria plugs up that vascular tissue and compromises circulation in the tree. And then here we see Leland cypress. With uh, This is a very common site for Leland cypress grown uh, in our part of the world. You see lots of interior uh, browning of, uh, of limbs and foliage and so on. It's because of these canker diseases that attack the Leland cypress trees so readily. Uh, ceridium canker, Latrosphere canker. Again, those cankers, you see example one here is oozing some pitch uh, there on, on the branch of the Leland cypress. You peel the bark away and underneath that bark, that vascular tissue, which should be a nice bright color, is not. It's a brown or a dark gray color under there telling you, it's showing you that that vascular tissue uh, is not uh, it doesn't work so well anymore. It's been, it's been compromised. Circulation has been compromised in that plant. Um, here is a, here's a laurel shrub, and we, you know, it's showing defoliation up here. You know, looks like it's, it's drying up. Why is it drying up? Because of issues down here uh, in the in the lower part uh, near the ground level. You know, that vascular tissue has been compromised uh, with the canker. You can see the cankers right here. Uh, lots of different ones, lots of different canker diseases out there. They can affect lots of different plants, but they all have the same sort of impact. They do damage that vascular tissue. Here's another example, a uh, closer up shot of that canker. You peel the bark away, you take a sharp knife, skin it away, and what should be nice bright colored areas uh, where the cambium layer is, is not that color. And that's an indicator to you that uh, that vascular tissue is no longer uh, uh, transporting water uh, up, the, uh, up the tree or energy back down the tree the way it should. Uh, what, so what can we do about wilt scorching canker diseases? Uh, are there treatment options? Well, the best approach is prevention. By minimizing stress on the plants, you strive to keep them vigorous. Uh, if there is dry, you go into hot dry spells. Even if it's an old established plant, they still need water. So think about using some irrigation on those. There are systemic insecticides uh, uh, that can minimize uh, some of the insects that can vector uh, a bacterial disease from one plant to another, like the back, uh, bacterial leaf scorch, you know, leaf hoppers may very well be vectors of that disease. So, so using a systemic uh, insecticide uh, on, uh, of, on, say, uh, pin oak trees, for example, can help minimize uh, uh, leaf hopper populations uh, and maybe cut down on the potential for that disease being spread from one tree to another. You know, some canker diseases might respond to copper fungicides, but by the time you see this kind of damage showing up that we saw in some of those previous slides, it may be too late. Um, you know, bacterial leaf scorch uh, uh, and, and other bacterial diseases uh, may uh, have re there may be some benefit from uh, injecting the tree with an antibiotic. Uh, and there are the, the services, pesticide applicators that can do that uh, and, and maybe hold it in check, but it doesn't cure it. It would have to, it would probably need to start uh, at the onset of the disease in order to, to stop its progression. And it would have to be done on, uh, on a somewhat regular basis in order for it to, uh, again, keep that disease in check because it's not going to cure it. And that may turn into a, a terribly expensive option. So probably the best thing is, you know, to try to keep those trees vigorous in the first place so that the natural defenses are working working uh, as they should. And finally, we'll close uh, uh, this, this little talk today by looking at uh, these examples. You know, this is uh, from a, a business, the, the parking lot area of a business in downtown Murfreesboro. Uh, boy, what's, what's wrong with those trees? Well, those trees have been topped. Okay, you'll notice you can see the stubs out here uh, all over. This, this, this used to be a nice, good-sized tree, had a lot of leaf foliage on it, nice canopy. Well, it's all been topped, and now you see all these suckers, if you will, water sprouts that have shot out from there. And it's just putting out leaf tissue, trying to catch sunlight, trying to make energy. That tree's gone through a big shock. Here's a, out of that same parking lot. You know, they've done it to, to every species of tree that was in there. Um, 
anytime that, that you see that, and here's a, 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 another tree uh, in a parking lot of a business just uh, uh, just down the road from the extension office in Murfreesboro. Uh, and you know, that tree looks dead. Well, the reason it looks dead is because it is dead. And anytime you see trees that have been topped, you, you, you see proof that, that people will pay to have their trees professionally killed because as, as I said at the start of this talk, you know, every tree out there, every plant out there is going to die. You know, we're not going to keep them from dying. But what we are trying to do is prolong those lives as long as possible. Well, topping these trees is not the way to do that. You are shortening that lifespan, uh, what the natural lifespan, the expected lifespan of that tree would be by topping them. So please don't do that. Uh, so folks, I'm going to end. That's all I've got today. And I'll close, uh, I'll close with that. Uh, as always, if you have, uh, if, if, if what we talked about today covered, uh, or if it prompted any kind of, uh, uh, any kind of questions in you, you know, feel free to contact uh, one of your local agents here in the Rutherford County Extension Office. You can reach us at, at the office via the phones at 615-898-7710. Uh, you can also go to the Rutherford County Extension uh, website and under a fact faculty uh, and staff uh, are about us. You can find our individual email addresses. But anyway, we're going to close with that. Uh, it's been my pleasure to spend this time with you today, and I hope you found this information useful. Uh, and until next time, uh, this is Mitchell Moat from the Rutherford County and uh, Tennessee State University, the University of Tennessee Extension Program, saying so long.